Hello and welcome to this PCORI hosted webinar series for hospitals and health systems on confronting COVID-19, finding hospital capacity and improving patient flow. Today's session focuses on managing emergency departments and the flow of patients into and out of them amid the pandemic. In coming weeks, we'll address other issues, including how hospitals can continue conducting urgent surgeries amid COVID-19, as we try to bring you the latest and promising practices and evidence as these are evolving amid the pandemic. Before I introduce today's speakers, let me orient you to aspects of this webinar platform and our process today. On the slide that you see in front of you now is a screenshot of the attendee interface. You should also be seeing something that looks exactly like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right-hand corner. Right now, by default, you're listening through your computer speaker system. But if you would prefer to listen over the phone instead, just select phone call in the audio pane and the dial in information will be displayed so you can call in separately on your phone. Please note that this webinar is being recorded to be posted on PCORI's website. The recording will be available to the public after this event. We'll also be taking questions for our speakers directly on this webinar. Please type those into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation and we'll try to answer as many as we can. Now we're going to turn to our topic of the all-important functions of the emergency department, or ED, amid COVID-19, and what those of you managing EDs amid this crisis need to know. In particular, we're going to focus on the management of the flow of patients into and out of the ED to other parts of the hospital, how new systems have been set up for this purpose at hard-hit hospitals, what bottlenecks have cropped up, what challenges have arisen, and how they have been met. Our speakers today are first, Eric Morley, who is clinical director in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Stony Brook University Hospital. That's the flagship hospital of the Stony Brook Medicine System on New York's Long Island. Eric is also deputy chief medical informatics officer at Stony Brook Medicine. We're also joined by his colleague, Peter Vicielio, who is the vice chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine and Associate Chief Medical Officer at Stony Brook Medicine. Also with us is Karen Morell, who's an emergency department physician at Adventist Health Lodi Memorial Hospital in Lodi, California. She's also affiliated with Qventus, a company that has built an artificial intelligence-based software platform to optimize patient flow in hospitals. Karen was formerly the physician lead for the 21 emergency departments in Kaiser Permanente's Northern California region. Joining me to pose questions to our two presenters are first, Eugene Litvak, who's president, CEO, and founder of the Institute for Healthcare Optimization. That's a nonprofit organization that catalyzes and spreads improvements in operations management and patient flow across the healthcare delivery system. Eugene is also an adjunct professor in operations management in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Also with us is Patricia Rutherford, who's vice president at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. That's the nonprofit organization that advances best practices for improving health and healthcare worldwide. At IHI, Pat's responsible for developing and testing innovations and new models of care, including optimizing care coordination and care transitions. So welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us on the webinar today. We're gonna to start with having our speakers set some brief context about the situations in which their health systems are operating at the moment. And Eric and Peter, we're gonna to turn to you first. We know that New York remains the epicenter of the COVID pandemic in the United States at present, with a caseload overall for the state projected to be nearing its peak and possibly even plateauing. So please give us a thumbnail description of what that means for your ED at the moment. Peter, you wanna start? Okay, so for those of you that might be at the beginning of this, I, I really would ask you to consider this. At the beginning of the epidemic here, we were screening for travel history, and if it was positive, we would put the patient in a negative pressure room and put on PPE to protect ourselves. But we weren't doing this for, for patients in the community that came in with a cold, and this was a mistake. So we started protecting ourselves from patient any patient with fever and cough. 
And that was a mistake because we weren't protecting ourselves from COVID patients without fever and cough. And I would say with the very first case you see in your community, you really need to start treating everyone as a possible COVID patient. We've had trauma patients, strokes, STEMIs, acute abdomens, all sorts of patients that turn out to have COVID. And I want you to imagine, for instance, a trauma patient carrying COVID that makes it to your uh, uh, surgical intensive care unit, but you're not treating them like that. You can take out the whole unit. One, one person can take out the whole unit. You need to have your whole institution wearing masks at all times, washing their hands like crazy, eliminating visitors, sending home anyone who can work from home rather than in the institution. Uh, I think a lot of our personnel who contracted COVID contracted it during this early period where we thought we could pick and choose who we needed to worry about. And you just simply can't. Even now, I will sometimes hear talk about having units for COVID and units for non-COVID. You really have to treat everyone as a potential uh, carrier. So, and also protect yourselves from each other. If you round as a group, you should do social distancing. You should be wearing masks. Uh, uh, there, just consider that there really is no safe place or safe person and be very careful. All your patients should wear a mask. The patient that comes in with a sprained ankle should should wear a mask. Uh, so th the final thing I'll say, uh, which Eric will detail, is once you see your first case, you should really anticipate that there's going to be an explosion. So at that point, I, I will, Eric, if you want to uh, uh, describe what's happened here. Yeah, Eric, sure. go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. So. So yeah, we we we've been doing this for a while, and uh, so as we as we started off, we saw our first you know patient under investigation on February 7th based on those strict guidelines. And I think I think one thing that's going to help everybody is we muddled through that at the beginning while we're sort of learning learning how to define patients. I think the rest of the country, if it hasn't hit you yet, I think a lot of those principles are 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 true. As once you start having community spread, treat everybody similarly. We first saw our first. Uh, patient on February 7th that was a DUI, and we really didn't start to see cases until early March. Once we started seeing cases, uh, the, the sort of the number exploded. On 3-9, we saw about 15 PUIs, and by 3-30, we had uh, we saw 250 PUIs in our emergency department. Uh, so that volume exploded um, fairly quickly, and uh, stepwise stepwise increased week by week. Um, so. Uh, as this volume has gone up, we are learning that we're, we're discharging about 70% of those patients home, admitting about 27% of the floors and 3% of the ICU. Uh, unfortunately, a significant number of these patients, two to three days into their course, are requiring intubation and being upgraded to the ICU, probably about 10 to 15% of these patients. So what we're left with are is a very crowded hospital. Uh, with with a dramatically expanded number of of ICU requirements and number of patients on vents in our hospital at this point. So fortunately, our new patient volume, our admissions are finally starting to go down as of the last couple of days. Our peak seems to be around March 30th. Uh, admissions are going down, and I'm cautiously optimistic, and we'll still continue to prepare for for more surge and uh, and a rebound effect. But I'm cautiously optimistic. The main issue, though, is that a lot of these patients that were intubated remain intubated for quite a long time, so we're nowhere out of the woods with, in terms of, of our, our demand upstairs. So that's sort of where we stand today. Great. Th thanks, Peter and Eric. So, Karen, what's the situation in Lodi, which, for those of you who don't know that much about California, that's a city that's about 90 miles east of San Francisco in the Central Valley. Karen? Hi, good morning. So first of all, I want to say I have so much respect for my colleagues in New York and, and all of us have learned so much from, from everything that they've experienced. In California, we expect us, the peak to hit us about April 26th to May 11th. So for us, even with that, knowing that we haven't hit our peak at all, about 70% of our volume is, uh, is low acuity patients who want to be treated and the rest are high acuity. So we're still seeing that. And I couldn't echo more what Peter and Eric have said that every patient 
can be positive. People coming in with an ankle, trauma patients who go to CT, they find it on their CAT scan. So every patient should be considered a patient of interest. Uh, the other thing I want to say is that social distancing seems to be working. And the fact that we started that early in our state means that our volumes are actually lower than expected in San Francisco, where they started earlier. And they're starting to peak today in Los Angeles. So so as always, we're behind New York. The wave seems to come east to west. So we're still expecting the tidal volume of volume to hit us later. Great. Well, some hopeful signs, despite uh, all of the important precautions you all are taking. So let's move to how your organizations have linked the ED to the overall incident command structure created for the pandemic. What's the relationship between the ED and incident command? What steps did you take in and create uh, to make that structure? And have you organized your teams within the ED? Eric, let's start with you on that. So yeah, so we, we, we function within a fairly large organization. And so this may look a little different from somebody in a smaller hospital. But very early on, early March, uh, we developed an incident command structure line with you know FEMA sort of uh, structure, and the emergency department is is inserted there as, as I was uh, named a branch uh, uh, director for the incident command structure that reports up to the medical director for the entire organization uh, directly, um, and I think that structure works really well. Uh, however, the thing that uh, I think I could have done differently in that role early on was getting people within my department to be experts on the various issues that would pop up. And uh, I, I think everyone else is gonna benefit from the lack of change that happens on a daily basis, like the type of PPE we should be wearing when the CDC changes, or the, uh, the, the, the testing uh, guidelines and whatnot. But very early on, there's quite a bit of information, and I, I wish early on I had organized several members of my team, you know, different attendings who wanted to help, uh, to have people responsible for different parts. So naming somebody, which was very beneficial, we eventually named somebody who was in charge of PPE uh, communication, somebody who's in charge of testing communication, uh, uh, communication with the ED staff at large. So, so giving somebody that job, as new information comes out, giving them that information uh, uh, is, is incredibly important. Um, and then having, having sort of staffing people, because trying to keep your, your, your sort of all this as one clinical director for department will probably overwhelm, the, regardless of the size of your department, will overwhelm that person. So developing that infrastructure, getting people on board within your department uh, is incredibly important and something I would recommend early on. Uh, I also uh, kind of got several people to join the daily incident command calls that we have so that I was not the only person receiving that information. One, for verification of what I'm hearing, and two, uh, in case I ended up getting uh, getting COVID and getting sick, it's really critical that you you make sure somebody else is available to to sort of take uh, carry the ball after you're done. And just to follow up, Eric, to what degree did was there clear understanding in the hospital administration that the ED was really key, that flowing patients into the hospital and out of the hospital, uh, into the ED, I should say, excuse me, and out of the ED was really going to help determine the overall hospital response. Yes, yeah, so I think we're, we're very lucky at Stony Brook that uh, our, our leadership was very aware of this early on. And in fact, before the incident command structure was put in place, I had been working very closely with the CMO and the CEO to start preparations way back in February. So I think they, they got it. And to a large degree, the ability for them to support us moving into, which we'll, I think we'll talk about in a little while, forward triage sites and the dramatic response that they had to increase ICU capacity upstairs early on uh, really, really allowed us to function quite well during this, uh, during this pandemic. Great, and thank you. And as you said, we'll come back to that whole question of the uh, forward triage unit. Karen, what, what are you all doing out at Lodi that, that, that actually, uh, either reflects what they're doing at Stony Brook or is different? Yeah, I think this is your time if you have a smaller ER. I function at a smaller place under a larger system to really get your relationships with administration right right now. Uh, they've been so key in helping us every day. So, so we have daily meetings with administration. They helped us with all those logistics like you talked about. They helped us with backup plans because most of other, other physicians may not be as busy as they normally were in the outpatient clinic or our, we canceled outpatient surgeries right away. So those doctors have been engaged to be kind of backup for us at that time. We also uh, started a daily call 
with all physicians so everyone could be updated at what was going on with our at our site and what was happening. So we had this transparency of information that was really helpful to um, not having this huge fear among our clinicians and also so everyone's on the same page and knows exactly what we're going to do every day. Great, <clears throat> great. So now let's go back to this topic of flow and talk about what was done with this external triage tent uh, at Stony Brook. Eric, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so early on, around uh, March 9th, actually, a couple days before we started seeing a surge, we sort of um, all got together and sort of saw the need for an alternate area to see patients. And thankfully, we all agreed to put it into effect even before we had a surge of patients. And we, we took over first an abandoned space that was going to be transitioned to a new care area in the coming months, and we turned that into a forward triage area. And essentially what we have is an, a greeter outside the ED who has a very simple set of screening questions, uh, age, no significant comorbidities, uh, and, uh, uh, and we put a pulse ox on them to make sure they're not hypoxic, and they can get steered towards this tent. You know, we went early on from about nine patients on the first day to the the, uh, the peak, we saw 154 patients in this uh, in this area. So for the first week and a half, we were in this area, and it became clear that this was going to become an inpatient space. So we were moved to a field tent. The field tent has about 20 20 beds, and uh, we have capability to do blood if needed. Although that is sort of very difficult because you need a courier service to bring the blood back. So we try not to do labs there, but we have portable chest X-ray capability there. Um, and to date, we we've seen about 100 patients a day in that tent, in that 20-bed area. Our peak was 154. Uh, we, we've had very few bounce backs. We've sent home uh, about 95% of our patients from this area, uh, and about 3 to 4% of them had re rebound visits, uh, but only a, a handful of them got admitted on their rebound visits, on their, on their revisits. So we think it's been really successful. And, and I have to tell you, one of the challenges is, the, the way you have to clean rooms and you have to, you have to keep people separated in your emergency department, the last thing we want is the, the, the usual 20 or 30 people sitting in our waiting room shoulder to shoulder. And I don't know how we would have accomplished this without a forward triage area. You know, and, and taking 100 to 150 patients out of the waiting room a day ha has been a lifesaver for us. And I, I don't think we could have functioned through this uh, without, without that capability. Um, so very early on, I, I would encourage anybody who's listening, figure out where you, where you would do this, an abandoned space in your, in your hospital, work with your local uh, governmental agencies to see if they have disaster tents that can be used in this situation and, and really start to figure out how you do this very early. And I, and I can just say, if you don't end up needing it, uh, I think that's okay. Because if you do need it, it, it has been a real lifesaver for us. Peter, you wanna to add to that? Yes, if I may. Uh, cognitively, I think we're all used to influenza outbreaks. And there's this gradual increase in patients coming in with influenza that the hospital has to uh, adapt to. This is something very different. Uh, Eric is talking about uh, keeping patients out of the emergency department, putting up a tent and this sort of stuff, and also about uh, creating capacity on the inpatient unit. Uh, I just want to uh, uh, talk a little bit about the tempo of this. Uh, because it's very different than anything anyone has done before. When we start to accumulate admissions in the emergency department, you cannot let that uh, happen. And what that means is by tomorrow or day after tomorrow, you may have to open up another ICU. You may have to open up another inpatient unit. This is not something that you where you plan next week we'll do it or two weeks from now we'll, we'll do it. You need to do it within the next couple of days. So you need to really be able to uh, move very quickly uh, in one in one direction, like Eric's describing, getting people the 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 walking wounded out to another area so they don't clog up the emergency department. But also, you cannot be boarding patients in the emergency department because within a day or two, you no longer have an emergency department. Great. Okay. And Karen, give us a sense of whether you've done something similar out at Lodi. 
I would say that every single hospital now should be considering a way to segment these patients out of the main ED. So for us, we put up a tent almost right away. And, and you'll see almost immediately, if it hasn't already, that almost all of your volume will become people who want to rule out for COVID. So we developed three segments, just like we do in our ER for low acuity, medium acuity, and high acuity. So patients are greeted right away at their car as they drive up. We do their vital signs in the car. And if they're stable with no high and are doing well, they're just going to be treated in the car and they're going to be talked to by someone in PPE. They're um, not going to get any complete full physical exam if they're in no respiratory distress and their oxygenation is normal. We're going to do tests if we have them available and we're going to give them standard discharge instructions. That way we've disimpacted the ER with all of this high volume of low acuity patients. Then we're reserving our tent for these medium acuity patients who we think might need um, a little bit more. We set up a, a portable chest x-ray just like the guys did in New York for, for patients who need x-rays. And we can do labs there, but I agree they're probably not of that much use uh, at this point. And um, then those patients, almost all of those patients get discharged from there. And that way we've preserved our emergency department for um, the higher acuity patients that need more testing and more treatment. And I also couldn't agree with Peter any more that right away, you should be thinking about what's your ICU capacity gonna be and what's your hospital capacity gonna be because um, right away we convert at one of our floors to uh, something that could be upgraded to an additional ICU to prevent boarding. So again, having that really close contact with your administration and really discussing everything as a team can be super key to getting all of this done. That's great. And I just want to take a quick question, Peter, that has come in from the, our listeners, which is what kind of testing is being done in that forward triage tent area at this point? Uh, Eric, you should answer this. Sure. So early on, we were, we were doing flu panels. And if somebody had a positive flu panel, then we would send, I mean, then we would skip COVID testing. But really what we found is that co-infection is probably a real issue. And, you know, we really needed to move to a model where, where we really get, get back to the basics and say what's essential to take care of the patient. And uh, it turned out that knowing their flu RSV status at this point probably doesn't help much. Slow down the functioning in the tent with decision making. And at this point, we are only doing COVID testing in the, in the field hospital. And we felt very early on that, that the RSV and flu testing probably caused more issues and more delays and wasn't very helpful to the management of, of, of the overwhelming majority of patients. Great, thanks, Eric. So let's talk now about the key learnings you all have had uh, within the ED as you've examined and treated patients. And Peter, please walk us through what you think are some of the critical lessons you've learned about functioning in the ED on multiple levels from use of PPE on, on down. Well, obviously, it's all PPE all the time. You, you really have to be careful of, uh, I found early on, or, or actually sort of well into this, sometimes consultants and other staff would walk through the emergency department and not be wearing a mask. So we would chastise them and put a mask on them and make sure that everyone was doing this uh, all the time. One of the very peculiar things, and this is reported everywhere, is that with the advent of COVID, we seem to have cured permanently appendicitis, <laughs> dammies, diverticulitis, kidney stones, low back pain, all sorts of entities we are just not seeing. And nobody has any understanding as to why. Uh, so beyond that, uh, you all have taken some various steps to uh, basically guard against uh, infection spread vis-a-vis uh, -vis having iPads in rooms. Eric, do you want to talk more about that? Actually, let me t take that one. Okay. Uh, um, you know, telemedicine is, is really being used everywhere now, but we are using it in a different way in the emergency department. We, we still go in the room and do in-person bedside evaluations. However, at the same time, we really want to subsequently minimize the number of times you have to go in the room and the number of people entering the room. So we created in our emergency department what basically was a video conferencing solution where there was an iPad in the room. We could connect to that iPad from a, either a computer, another iPad, or a phone, and we could talk directly with the patient outside the room. 
So now the nurse, the hospitalist, the consultant, and I can all converse with the patient remotely. And that's not only saves staff exposure, uh, it, it, improving our communication with the patient, but it also saves a lot of PPE for uh, by making unnecessary visits just for communication. Uh, if there are bedside needs, we still re-enter the room, but otherwise we try to have all verbal communication occur outside. And the other nice aspect of this is that the hospitalist or consultant didn't even have to come to the emergency department. They could link into the patient's room really from anywhere. Great. And uh, you also are with all patients, uh, as I understand it, in the ED having a palliative care discussion. Is that correct, Eric or Peter? Um, yeah, and this was sort of, uh, uh, we tried to make the standard practice uh, for any of the sicker patients in general before this, but we've, we've sort of really tried to increase that awareness and have those discussions early on. Uh, that they are always important, not, not only in COVID times, but those clear discussions need to happen, and, the, and we are doing that, and it's more important than ever right now. And then, uh, Peter and Eric, before we go to Karen, I want to ask you, I know you've learned a lot about when hypoxic patients should or should not be intubated. So let's give everybody, we don't want to make this a CME discussion today necessarily, but give everybody uh, some insight into that. Peter or Eric, you want to take so, that? So this is actually a quite a controversial area. Uh, when COVID first started, the conventional wisdom was that you had to intubate hypoxic patients early, uh, and yet they did terribly on a ventilator, but the presumption was it was because it was a terrible disease. And this has more recently been questioned in a lot of ways, that uh, maybe we should be doing more non-invasive uh, ventilation and, not, and trying to avoid people putting on a, um, a, a ventilator. A couple of things that we're rolling out and that are it's always done on patients on a ventilator of, uh, but it's a complicated thing to do is proning the patient have the patient move in different positions it helps them re recruit different parts of the lung and improves their oxygenation well this is very easy to do on an awake patient and we think that it's possible we might be able to uh, uh, get a lot more patients through without ever having to intubate them. But even if that fails, uh, if you intubate them five days from now instead of two days from now, you've saved some ventilator time in the in face of potential ventilator shortages. So this is a, this is a uh, uh, an area where the, it's a moving target. There's a lot of discussion on what the best management is, and I would recommend that all healthcare providers try to keep on top of this. I would suggest uh, EM Crit, which is a uh, podcast website as an excellent source for getting the most up-to-date uh, controversy on management. Karen, what's the situation in all of this vein at Lodi at the moment? What are you doing? The thing that I would say is that you can't do enough of these uh, trial patients as well. We had a couple really critical patients that came in that we had to intubate. And you'll find your staff, it's really hard for them to stop and hold up and put, make sure they had complete PPE on and were ready to do the intubation safely and make sure everyone else has left the room. So be sure you practice, practice, practice if you haven't had a lot of patients. Another small issue that we found that we never even thought about before is that we really want to have this closed system for our ventilators and not bag patients for a long time. But we actually found out that uh, we were trying to calibrate our ventilators after intubation, so it was a one or two minute delay. So now we just uh, have a ventilator that's on all the time. So for some of the bigger systems, I'm sure you just have that all the time, but if you have a smaller hospital that you aren't using ventilators every minute of the day, uh, just make sure that you have one ready to go at all times that so that you can keep the closed system going on. And we also, again, um, the palliative care discussion where we have uh, scheduled a series of seminars with our physicians. So we've always talked about doing palliative care, but we haven't been that good at it, to be honest with you. So now we're actually trying to have those discussions right up front with patients um, as they come in so that we can kind of help our intensivists and our colleagues on the floor. We've really become a close-knit team in the entire hospital, I think. Great, thanks. Let's take another uh, quick question from a listener. 
how often are you changing out PPE after a certain number of patient interactions? Does the staff wear the same set of PPE for the whole shift? Eric, can you take that one? Sure. So in our, our department, we are we are leaving our eye protection and N95 on the entire shift at this point, and uh, covering our N95 either with either with or both a full face shield and uh, a surgical mask over the N95. And this, this really has both one conserved a lot of PPE, but I actually think the more important component of that, and I think the people that really adhere to this, we're seeing low infection rates in our, our, our attendings, residents, PAs, and nurse practitioners on the front line, is that they're not touching their face and their PPE over and over again. And I think that's a really important thing, and I, I don't have any data to back that up, but I think that's an important concept. Not removing your PPE is, is, is actually an important thing. Um, we are still in the ED taking our gowns on and off because we still are seeing 20 to 30 percent of our patients are non-COVID patients, and so we're removing those gowns. Uh, so on some of the floors that are 100 percent COVID, they are they are actually keeping their gowns on as well to conserve to some degree. Um, but and in our field tents where it's all all COVID essentially, we are keeping our gowns in place, and that that conserves a lot of PPE. Okay, great. All right, so let's talk about the flow now of patients from the ED who go to other parts of the hospital, either the floors or the ICU, and what you're doing to optimize that flow. And in particular, uh, how do are you finding uh, patients? Uh, we, this is a question, a question that came in from a listener. How many patients go to floors who then later on are upgraded to ICU? So let's get a sense of that overall flow from you, Eric, for starters. Right. So, so far to date, um, we have uh, discharged uh, probably about two to 3,000 patients, uh, somewhere in that ballpark. We've got our data collections a little better at the 17th. So, from the 17th, then we've discharged about 2,000 patients. Regular floor admissions made up about 27%, and from the ED, about 3% went to the ICU. Of that, we're finding about 10 to 15% with a mean, mean, mean of 48 hours or so, are getting intubated or moved to the ICU after admission. So quite a, a large number. And it turns out it's actually fairly difficult to predict which patients those are going to be. Um, so the ICU burden is, is quite high. So only 3% out of the ED, but overall uh, it's, it's, it probably is, is more on the order of uh, you know, 10% of the patients are ending up, 5 to 10% of the patients are ending up in the ICU. Great. And Karen, what's the situation uh, at Lodi? Recognizing well, your So far, the... we've, uh, yeah, we what haven't the... hit the peak at all, like uh, like our New York colleagues. So, so for us, people are coming in really sick so far. And then um, of our patients who go up to the floor, uh, only a small percentage have been upgraded to the ICU, but again, we have not hit peak at all. So people either, the interesting thing, we are seeing, seeming to see a lot more of the cardiac uh, things where people seem to come in sick with a uh, cardiac uh, illness instead of just the respiratory. I don't know if you guys have seen that a lot in New York. Yes, myocarditis is very common amongst these patients here. Among the COVID patients? Yes. Yeah. Correct. Okay. okay. Um, what you you all have had at the at Stony Brook some kind of an issue about uh, patients being put in rooms together if they're COVID positive and the limitations on that if you don't know that a particular patient is positive. So that's been a kind of a bottleneck you've experienced, Eric. Can you talk about that and how you've dealt with that? Uh, absolutely. So up front, I just want to be very clear, something that has saved our organization uh, and leadership was very proactive. And the, the, the maintenance teams have been working not, night and day and created probably an additional, turned regular rooms, an additional 70 or 80 ICU capable rooms in our hospital, expanded oxygen cap capabilities. And that, that, to be honest with you, has saved us. And we have very few ICU holds, ICU holds in the emergency department at this point. But despite this, we, we are not, we, we increase beds in our hospital using abandoned space, old space, et cetera. But the, the problem is early on when the patients are, are not COVID positive yet, you can't really cohort these patients together. So that ends up, ends up decreasing your total number of beds quite substantially. 
as the COVID results become positive, we can then cohort those patients together. So that, that's something you have to think about too. Don't look at your absolute number of beds and say you're gonna be able to fill them all uh, because you know patients do not wanna be cohorted in potentially COVID positive rooms when they don't know their status themselves. So I think that that is something you really have to consider that you're going to decrease your capacity quite quickly as you start to have COVID tests pending. Um, and so that, that, that has made, been a major complication in getting patients upstairs. So I think the real answer is figure out your testing, work with your lab very early. Uh, we are lucky that we are now running COVID tests in-house and our lab has done phenomenal work to get up to speed to do that. And so we are prioritizing admission, admitted patients to pre preferentially get tested in-house and we can do our send out uh, uh, for patients who aren't being admitted to try to improve that cohorting process. Also work closely with the labs that you send out to and, and try to figure out what their turnaround time is going to be and uh, try to have your lab, you know, work out processes with some of these external labs that can ensure uh, a better turnaround time. Okay, great. Uh, Karen, t tell us about what you're doing there that's uh, at all different at this point. Again, recognizing that you're at the lower end of the curve. Yeah, I never thought I would know so much about supply chain as I know now, but I couldn't agree with, with Eric anymore. If you can get in-house testing, that could really help uh, get your flow much far improved into your hospital. And uh, other than that, we're pretty much following all of the same recommendations that they're doing in New York. The only other thing I would say is that patients that we thought were being admitted with CHF exacerbations or COPD or things like that, any respiratory complaint, they've all come out positive for COVID. So just assume that people have it at this point. Okay, great. We have a lot of questions that have come in about PPE use and that we have covered some of those, but there's one very important question about N95 masks. Uh, and are, are those being worn at all times in the ED by everybody? Peter, Eric, do you want to take that? Absolutely, every minute. We we do not take it off, uh, and it's it's absolutely the safest thing to do. Like Eric says, by having a mask on, you can't touch your nose and mouth. And I think you've also mentioned that when you go into a patient room, you'll put a surgical mask on top of the N95 mask. Correct? Yes. Okay. Great. And then let's just take a quick, this quick question that came in about medication usage. As we know, there's been a lot of controversy now over hydroxychloroquine use, uh, antiviral uses, et cetera. What, what medications are you giving uh, the patients in, in most serious need, Eric and Peter? We're involved in a number of different studies uh, to try to determine effective treatments. Uh, I know hydroxychloroquine is the is the popular one, and we are we are using that. The data is not yet clear on this. I personally, I think it's pretty clear that this that it's not going to end up being a yes no. That yes, if you get it, you're fine, and no, if you don't, you're dead. Uh, whether or not it it takes the edge off of the illness is yet to be determined. Okay. So one. One thing I will reassure people, you know, a lot of our low risk patients are going home uh, without it at this point, and the pharmacies typically don't even have these regimens anymore. Uh, and they seem to be doing well if they're, if they're in the lower risk group, so not hypoxic, uh, no major findings on their chest x-ray. These, these patients seem to be doing well, but I think we need a lot more data on this before we can actually make any evidence-based recommendations based on, on, on what's happening. I think that data just doesn't exist yet in a, in a, in a larger quantity, especially for the lower risk patients. Okay, great. Now, uh, another question from a listener. We, we all know that a lot of uh, organizations are recruiting either retirees or uh, transfers or others who are coming into the system and they haven't been in, in all instances uh, necessarily up to speed on uh, patient care, let alone under COVID. So what are you doing to uh, buck up those personnel who might be a little bit rusty, Eric and Peter? I think any any physicians that uh, that this is not their main thing, they need to get up to snuff on how to care for these patients. It's not just retirees, but if you have cardiologists or or gastroenterologists that are called in to, to provide inpatient care for these patients, they need to get up to snuff. And there are a few resources that I think are quite good. The Society for Critical Care Medicine 
has a uh, program of intensive care for the non-intensivist, which I think is needed really to take care of these patients. Also on the EM Crit website, there is a there's a focused educational stuff on how to take care of the COVID patient. There's a lot of stuff there about how to put on and take off PPE. There's a lot of stuff about how to set up uh, uh, non-invasive ventilation uh, and and with some sort of Rube Goldberg tricks and whatnot. But I think anyone that it, where this is out of their domain, they need to uh, really dive in and understand this disease. It's, it, it, the knowledge that you may have as a physician about influenza does not necessarily crosswalk to the coronavirus. It's a, it, it, patients are very different. Well, great. Well, I thanks. Agree with the that. only other. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. No, Karen, did you want to add something to that? I just wanted to quickly add, I'm sorry about that, uh, is that there's such a huge high volume of low acuity patients that you can really create the standard work around that. And those are the ones that we've employed physicians who haven't worked quite as long. And that way we've preserved our ED staff for the more high acuity patients. So that's something else to consider. Obviously still with the training and the PPE and everything else that you're, that Peter talked about, but but it's a very high volume of low and medium acuity patients as well. Great, thanks. So I wanna bring Pat Rutherford and Eugene Litvak into this conversation. I know Pat, you, you've been uh, interested in how moderately ill patients who are discharged to home fare. Uh, you could also incorporate one of the questions that you see has come in from our listeners, uh, if you like. Sure, thank you, Susan. And just first to start off, I'd just like to thank our, our panelists you know, for your leadership in your own organizations and for your willingness to share uh, your experiences and your advice for those uh, who are dealing with this throughout our country and beyond. So a tremendous thanks to each of you. Um, on, on what Susan has mentioned, uh, I do have, a, 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 I'm curious about what, what opportunities are there to provide um, care within the home? So for example, the moderately ill patients who come into the ED and may not at this point need to be uh, admitted. Are there ways that you're using like with case managers or care managers or nurse practitioners or others that are helping to provide the supports that they may need in their home for the moderately ill patients and for those who might choose more palliative care options? Uh, are there things you're doing in either of those regards? Eric, you want to start with that and Peter and then we'll go to you, Karen. So I'll speak specifically to follow up. Our our ID team has redeployed some of their people that do usual work uh, to follow up on the COVID positive patients that are discharged, and they're using telehealth visits to do that. And I, and I will say across the organization, from our you know diabetes physicians to, to to the different different divisions, have really really expanded their capabilities very quickly to do telehealth. And fortunately, I think that'll actually be a long long standing improvement to our healthcare system in general. But that that capability has been dramatically increased in the last few weeks. And, and Peter and Eric, do you send any patients home with pulse oxes or thermometers or anything else uh, to help monitor? Peter, they're all sold out. So you can't get a pulse ox. You can't get it. It's 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 hard to get a, even a thermometer. But over time, if supplies free up, that would be a good thing, in theory, oh, correct? I yeah, okay. Karen, what's happening at Lodi? Yeah, we're still pretty lucky with our supply chain again on that thing. So we do send people home a lot of times with thermometers for sure, pulse oxes a lot, home oxygen as needed, and then these strict return instructions to try and preserve. I think this is a perfect time to do a lot of home health. Our case managers almost immediately went to virtual care. And just like uh, Peter and Eric said too, all of our outpatient is doing these virtual visits, which I think will be a huge uh, bone in the and help to us in the future. Great. Eugene, let's bring you into the conversation. I know this, your flow is your uh, area of expertise. What, what questions do you want to address to our presenters? Uh, uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, and first of all, I want to join Pat and thank all of you being frontliners. I mean, you are frontliners among frontliners. So, so let me ask you a question. Peter, you mentioned that you should, and properly so, that you should consider 
uh, if you are a caregiver, you should consider every patient to be potentially uh, infected. Uh, from your perspective as a caregiver, but in terms of placing patient, if you assume that every patient is uh, COVID infected and you put all of them together on the floor, how about those who are not infected? How quickly you get the test results and how would you separate those who are infected from those who are not infected? If you assume that all of them are infected, then it puts huge stress, I would say, on the hospital resources and psychologically. So that's a question for everybody. So, and I just, I just want to quickly restate Eugene's question in case uh, there were some audio difficulties there. But it's really how how do you cohort these patients if if you're assuming that all patients are potentially uh, COVID positive? How do, what does that do to your flow issues since you really can't direct patients to one specific area or another based on whether they're COVID positive or not? Eric, so, but there are there are some patients that have to work up. You you do if they have no uh, symptoms of the COVID syndrome, right? They, that their chest X-ray is normal. They have no fever. They have no symptoms, and they came in to say a hip fracture. I think we have to cohort them somehow. We're not testing every single patient. We are testing the overwhelming majority of our patients, but we do have. I, I think it's actually easier to create clean areas where you will send patients that you believe to be COVID-free than it is to actually try to create dirty areas to contain it, right? So I think trying to set up some units that can take patients that are that, that do look like they do not have any 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 uh, sort of indication of COVID and creating those clean areas is probably easier than trying to commit to claiming to creating the, the, the uh, COVID-infected areas, if that makes sense. So once you, if you have the luxury of rapid turnaround on COVID tests, then you can uh, you may be able to function institutionally in a different way uh, even given that the the COVID test is not perfect there are people that have COVID where the test will be negative so uh, in response to Eugene's question in a way I think it's it, when, you, when you're dealing with the unknown it's actually simpler for the institution just to approach every patient as if they are a potential COVID patient Karen, okay, thank, you. thank you. Karen, anything yeah. to add to that? You know, I agree that every patient should be considered to have COVID and until we know things. The other thing is I wonder, I echo Peter, is that I wonder what's going to happen when this is done because the unmet demand, all we're seeing are patients who want to be ruled out for because we have a very low volume of our standard ED patients right now. Yeah, I have <laughs> patients actually call me up and ask, when can I have my appendicitis? Okay. Well, everybody wants to schedule everything, I suppose. Uh, so <laughs> let's talk, let's go back to a question that came in earlier about um, learning among the New York area, metropolitan New York area hospitals. Uh, has there been a network form where you all are learning from each other as, uh, as the pandemic, pandemic progresses? Peter, you want to take that? Well, there are... Uh weekly or more often than weekly podcast uh, where uh, physicians from all over the United States participate in what their experience is, what they're seeing, how they've responded to it. People will talk about, get down into very specific details about intubation and this sort of thing. So there is, there is really a national community of sharing experience. Of, of, uh, one of them is through uh, EMRAP, the other is through EM Crit, and I and I'm sure there are a number of others as well. But there is a community sharing of of uh, what is a rapidly changing uh, paradigm for what we see and how we manage it. And I suppose that ties back to Eric's point about the importance of having uh, dedicated physicians who are monitoring those areas very closely and bringing back to the team. Of uh, that knowledge as it is emerging from other places. Would you agree, Eric? Yeah, so early on, uh, a, a small, very small group of us tried to manage a lot of this, and then we realized we needed a lot of help. And we actually used the Microsoft Teams um, app at Stony Brook to organize our meetings. I mean, there are various techno you know, technology you could use. We use Microsoft Teams because it's hyper secure for us, but we now have a daily meeting that's made up of residents, our lead PA, nursing leadership, 
and about four or five of our attendings where we have meetings every day and we all report out on our different areas. And I have to tell you, once we started that, this all became a lot easier. And, you know, people may think that their staff don't want to get involved with that level of work, but it turns out that actually most of them want to be on that call and want to be part of it every day. So I encourage people to get that kind of infrastructure set up as early as possible. The more people keeping their eye on the important things, building your own incident command structure within your department is a critical action, in my opinion. So we have a question that has come in about whether the physicians are using or support the use of remote monitoring devices to monitor patients' oxygen levels, respiration, et cetera, offsite. So this would be, again, for the patients who are sent home. Eric, Peter? Uh, we don't, uh, at least out of the emergency department, we don't have that capacity here. And as I mentioned, we don't have, uh, there are no pulse oxes on the shelves of Target or CVS or any other places that we can find. So it's basically uh, instructing people to self-isolate or self-quarantine and return if they uh, get worse, particularly if they're having trouble breathing, that they need to return for a reevaluation. We have found, though, that in terms of um, the evaluation of the patient, physical exam is not nearly as important as how the patient looks and what their pulse ox is and their vital signs. So that can all be measured remotely if you have the equipment to do so. Uh, but doing so in this environment is a challenge, obviously. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just quickly, we want to circle back to one more PPE question, which is how often does the PPE get changed out? Uh, Eric or Peter, you want to take that? So we've talked about wearing the mask uh, all day long. If uh, What we do is if you are in the room of a, a patient where there's you are concerned about aerosolization, like intubation uh, or uh, nebulization and that sort of stuff, Everything is changed out when you leave the room. Uh, for our N95s, we have a uh, a uh, ultraviolet light machine that we can stick our N95s in at the end of shift that presumably will zap any viruses on it. If you've had an aerosolization uh, procedure, we have a, uh, a new piece of equipment now where the mask can be sent there, ster uh, sterilized, and then sent back to the uh, uh, individual. Okay, thank you. Uh, Pat, I want to bring you back in. I know you care a lot about uh, mental health issues broadly. There's mental health of staff and there also are potentially mental health issues of patients. Do you uh, go ahead and pose a, a question to any of our panelists? Uh, thank you, Susan. Um, uh, this may uh, be related to the pent-up demand that I think uh, Peter uh, mentioned before about patients that routinely come to the ED who are not coming to the ED. I think many EDs have seen up to 40% of the population that they see in the EDs have mental health disorders or challenges. Do, are you seeing that uh, diminish as well as appendicitis and, and AMIs in the ED right now? Or um, is that something that is uh, still uh, an important issue to deal with? Well, it's always an important issue to deal with, but yes, we have seen a decline in those patients, a dramatic decline. Okay. Yeah, our CPAP is seeing about a third of the patients they used to see. So. Wow. And, and the corollary there that Susan mentioned is, uh, are there things, I think, that the stressors on staff, uh, not only for the people in their care, uh, working in different environments, learning new competencies, many of the things that I think are probably pretty challenging for some uh, in addition to their potential worries for what uh, they, if they're going back to families and what their risks are for their own health or for family members, are there supports that um, either of you or in your institutions putting in place um, proactively or reactively to help uh, staff? So I, if I can comment uh, on this, uh, we're trying to do a lot of stuff for our, for all of our staff, but this is, uh, the, a conversation I've never heard before when staff are talking with each other and say, I wonder which one of us won't be here by the time this is over. So I can, uh, I plead with everybody, please take care of your nurses. 
they have the, the most exposure to these patients. And you need to take care of them more than you ever have. If you hear something that they need, uh, take care of it that day. Don't make one-off gestures. Think of things that you can do every day, every shift, to let them know what gratitude you have. Um, uh, just, I, I just, I, whatever it is, if it's scrubs, equipment, IT issues, uh, simplifying documentation requirement, addressing childcare, getting them food, whatever it is you can think of. Just do everything you can to let them know that uh, you're behind them. Karen, what would you add yeah. to that? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I've never seen this level of anxiety in some of the most hardcore ER people I've ever seen ever. So we actually found that our staff really love to talk among themselves and huddle and and really um, debrief among themselves. They didn't find bringing in uh, our employee assistants or a chaplain really helped as much as talking among themselves. And then every little thing can really help. Again, bringing in food, supporting them in every way, rounding all the time as leadership, having our administration come down and thank them. Every little thing is so important. And also, um, we've really implemented much more telehealth for psychiatry now because that's something that's uh, already been proven is something that's really good to do so we tried to do some community outreach for that as well to try and get telehealth for psychiatry because again there's going to be this unmet demand that's going to come pouring in once this is all over but you can't support your staff uh, any more than at this time if there are any physicians on this uh, webinar I, although I've been doing this for years, I would ask you to do this every single shift. At the end of your shift, personally go up and thank each nurse that you worked with and tell them what a great job they did. You have no idea how much it may mean to them. Great, great, great advice, Peter. Thank you. And Karen. Eugene, let's take a final question from you and then we will move to wrap up the webinar. Yeah, so thank you, so uh, here, here is my question. Uh, there are many interventions that uh, some of you uh, introduce, like Peter introduced full capacity protocol, early discharge, etc., that the floors and the hospitals can do to unload uh, ED workload, patient volume. Uh, do you think that your floors are doing everything possible, or you think there is a room for improvement? What, what would help the ED if the hospital wards would do something else, like early discharge, full capacity, or something else? Eugene, right now, I think our institute yeah. is doing the impossible. They really are. They're 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 so far ahead of this. It's it's stunning to see what they have accomplished. When you add 60 or 70 ICU beds and another couple of hundred floor beds in short order, that is a real card trick. Eric, I don't no, know I, if you want to do that. Yeah, I I think that the one thing that Stony one of one of the many things actually that Stony Brook has done very well is we have all sort of been on the same page of that everybody will be asked to do what they need to be asked to do and that it is necessary. And, and to that regard, to your question, that the floor has done such a good job of getting these ICU patients out that we probably have less ICU holes now than we did in January or, or, or December. And so I've actually turned to my team and, and asked them to actually start helping the inpatient teams manage the patients in, in the ED, which is, you know, I know that to some of the people listening, that might sound, you know, uh, like the unthink unthinkable, but I've actually, you know, asked them to, to do that because of the amazing job that they have people taking care of patients, inpatients who've never done this in a long time. And uh, I think the, the concept needs to be on a day-by-day -day basis, everybody needs to do exactly what it is they're asked and, and, and do as much as they possibly can to help the other teams. And getting back to the mental health concept a little bit it ties into this. I think one of the positives of this, if you can, if you can dream, dream up any positives out of all this, is I've never seen in any healthcare system the level of teamwork and the ability to look past what they're normally expected to do and go above and beyond. And I think that is what gets you through something like this, to be quite honest. Thank you. Thank you for, for doing that. And I can only hope that post-epidemic time we will preserve, preserve some of those uh, activities that you're talking about now. Great. Well, we have covered a lot of really important ground today. 
and uh, some lessons learned, starting with uh, Peter's advice to uh, expect and prepare for the worst, because that may in fact occur even after only a few patients uh, begin to show up. We've heard about uh, the, Eric's point about making sure that you've got a sort of a dedicated expert on your team following all key areas of a rapidly changing uh, set of guidances from PP use uh, to medications, et cetera. Uh, we've talked about the importance of this flow issue that was addressed by virtue of setting up the outside triage tent and how that really did ease the burden on the ED to be able to deal with many patients in that tent as possible. We've talked about uh, the importance of bucking up uh, the returnees and getting them quickly up to speed and not just the returnees but other physicians who are coming in to help out at the ED, helping to get them up to speed. Uh, and then of course we've talked about some of the mental health issues uh, as well as so much more. I'm just going to very quickly close by asking each of you, Eric, and Peter and Karen to quickly uh, answer if you knew one thing at the outset of all of this that you know now uh, that would have caused you to do something differently, what would that have been? And let's just try to keep these to 30 second responses from each of you. Eric, do you want to start? Yeah, so again, I, I think we've done some things really well, some things we can improve, but from a personal standpoint, uh, and what I could have done better was include a much bigger team from the outset and get everybody in this incident command mindset in a much earlier stage. And that is a lesson I'll take with me for a long time for a lot of issues. And Peter. Uh, one very simple thing. I think the PPE issue, PPE issue uh, early on is a big issue. I will tell you, I have heard of physicians early on in this being criticized for wearing a mask all shift. I really tried to push our staff very early on, just wear a mask the whole shift. We'll see how this plays out. And the ones that fail to do so, I think, put themselves in a vulnerable position. So that if one thing I would say is from the earliest moment, just lock, lock down everybody's face. Great, and Karen? Well, I think all of us across the country are learning from what Peter and Eric are doing. So again, my total respect to them in New York because they are the epicenter. But the thing that I would do is really integrate the system that we're using for COVID with all of the systems we have, all of the problems we have across healthcare in the future, because uh, I would use, I would bring my administration on board much earlier and work on things like supply chain right away. Great. Well, thanks to all of you uh, speakers on our panel today. I want to tell the audience that we are posting, we will be posting a summary of this conversation on the Bacori website in coming days. So look for that. Also a recording will be posted there later today of this conversation. And more information about the overall webinar series is available at pcori.org slash confronting COVID-19. So look for that information there. You can see that URL on your screen. Please join us for our next uh, installment of this webinar series, which will be next Tuesday, April 14th, from 11.45 a.m. to 12.45 p.m. We'll be taking up the topic of elective and urgent surgeries amid COVID-19. As we know, there are lots of patients who still have the need for conventional cancer surgeries, transplant surgeries, et cetera. How do you carry those out in, when the hospital is already in the throes of COVID-19 response? So we'll be talking about that, as I say, next week. Uh, I want to say a special thanks again to our presenters, Eric Morley, Peter Vicielio, and Karen Morell. Thank you so much. And thanks to our discussants, Pat Rutherford and Eugene Litvak. And I wish a good day to everybody listening on this webinar today. And we'll hope uh, that you'll tune into our webinar next week. Thanks a lot and goodbye. <laughs>